Hi everyone, my name is Natalie of the Alternative Belgium channel and in this video we're visiting one of my favorite World War I sites the Dodenhang in Dutch, in Flemish, or the Trench of Death, on the Ezerfront near the town of Dixmude, Dixmude in West Flanders. It's one of the best conserved trench sites in Belgium, in Flanders fields. A bit of background on this site. So we're in the early days of the Great War. The Germans have entered Belgium in early August 1914, and as such, involving this neutral country, as well as the British Empire, in the war. So after the fall of Antwerp in early October 1914, the Belgian army and its allies managed to retreat and they withdrew to the extreme west of Belgium where they couldn't be outflanked anymore. So they retreated behind the Eze River and were able to stop the Germans there. However, the threat and the pressure from the Germans increased and they were outmanned. So then the local lockmaster at Mewport, not too far from here, came up with a very genius idea. So to open the locks at high tide a few nights in a row and as such flood the west bank of the Ezer River. So they created a vast area of water and mud between the two sides. It worked. Mobile warfare came to a definite stop here and the front line from the North Sea until just north of Iber, the so-called Ezer Front, didn't practically change for four years. Both sides dug in. So where we are right now here, we are near the town of Dixmude, on the banks of the Ezer River. So while more to the north, the opposing trenches had, it, had this vast flooded area between them, here the trenches came dangerously close to each other again. On the side of the Ezer were the Belgian trenches, while on the other the German trenches. Nowadays the German trenches have disappeared, but they were more or less where the bike path, where the bike road is now. It is basically just this small part that we that we will see today in the Dodenhang, the, the trench of death that has survived. But the entire area was basically scarred by trenches going to the hinterland, craters of exploded shells, etc. It really looked like a moon landscape. Not a tree, not, not even some grass here and there anymore, just mud and a few big holes and a few poppies uh, coming out. So while the Germans were on the other side of the river, they also had a few strongholds on this side of the river of the Ezer. In the course of the Battle of the Ezer, the Germans had taken the petrol tanks on the west bank of the Ezer, which served as an excellent observation post for them, so they could see all the movements in the trenches of their opponents, the Belgians. Because of this threat, the Belgians tried to capture these in a series of assaults, but the Germans were able to defend the petrol tanks with a few well-positioned machine guns. Also because, of course, you have to think the terrain was terrible, it was muddy, uh, you couldn't really run uh, through it. Uh, so following a number of bloody skirmishes with the German units, they decided to shorten their trench while expanding it into an unassailable concreted stronghold with the ominous, ominous name, the Trench of Death. Together with the Horsemen's Redoubt, the Belgians will continue to further fortify this area and they defended it to the death. So here is the best view of the trench area. With the double-decker trench, the Horsemen's Redoubt there, that's where the Trench of Death starts. The Belgian front line that goes all the way there. And we will also see the German position on this side. So here we can see the double-decker trench, the Horsemen's Redoubt. We're going to go in here. So two levels, as I mentioned before, the lower level are the shelters. I wouldn't go in there now, it has rained a few days, so they're kind of flooded. They have a layer, they have a bit of water, which actually is great because this is how it was back in those days, of course, as well. So we have more shelters here. That is, of course, because artillery shells were going back and forth all the time. So soldiers had to duck away when uh, the artillery, when shells were flying around their heads. We're gonna go up here to the upper level of the double-decker trench of the, the Horseman's Redoubt. And we're gonna go to this side first. Look here, you can see the view they had from the, from the Horseman's Redoubt, from the upper level. That's the start of the supply trench and next to that on the right-hand side 
to zigzag fight a trench? You have one of those uh, observation shooting positions. It's very important to know that how the trench is now. This would be 1916, 1917. So this is a very kind of luxurious uh, modern trench from more or less the second part of, uh, of the war in the early days this would not have been he been there would not have nothing would have was made out of concrete everything was just like holes dug in the ground here we can see another machine gun machine gun position they were all and you can see this is great they have pictures here as well they were always with at least three people in one of those positions and from here on you can see both the Erze river and this position is perpendicular on the main trench on the fighting trench and the supply trench and that is because they also had to target their own positions their own trenches in case they were raided by the germans so they could shoot the intruders the invaders continue still that way as well but we are going again down a few steps to the signal post this one is the signal post mind your head when you're trying to go, to go in there we'll try and I'll try not to bump my head this was a signal post so from here you know they were in communication with the observation post and they signaled hand sound light signals to behind the line behind the double deck trench behind the horseman's redoubt the artillery would have been there so they let them know when they should be ready to shell Here we're back at the Ezer River. So we're of course on an observation deck that nobody in those days would have been on. This would have been too dangerous. But you can also see here how close by the Germans were. They were just where the bike path on the other side of the river is. Very close by. There we have the town of Dixmude and the Ezer Tower. So here we have a great view over the trenches. The first one on the right hand side is the zigzag trench, it's the fighter trench. Zigzag of course that if a shell was falling in the trenches or, or blew up just above it, that the damage was limited. And of course if it would be a straight trench then if just one machine gun was on one end they can shoot just everybody. And then on the left to that you have the supply trench. This is straight of course because you had this single track narrow gauge rail, uh, railroad track there. Here you can get a better idea of how these rail tracks looked like back in those days. And again, you can see this is this uh, double decker trench, the horseman's readout, but this was just half of it. There was another part just in front of me, just on the other side of the rail track. But that one has mostly disappeared and was not uh, reconstructed. The supplies were brought in this way. We're going to go through the zigzag trench. This was an active trench, of course. You can see quite high. The main dangers were, of course, the snipers on the other side of the river. But, of course, you also had the shells, the artillery, that there was also the constant risk, especially at night then, of raids. Um, some of the soldiers were sent on a night patrol in no man's land, or they were sent to raid the opposing trenches of the Germans, which, of course, was a very dangerous task to get. You can see these connection between the supply trench and the fighter trench. Here you can also see that the sandbags are there more intact. So what they did is mix sand and concrete in these bags and that's why they became so hard, uh, easily uh, easier to conserve as well. So and right here we are also seeing the first bunkers here and they're all the same size. It's about two meters on two meters on two meters more or less. Photographs you on this photograph you can see that you know they just had a small step there so when they had to shoot they just had to go up there so trenches were higher up and 
interestingly enough, this photo, trench periscope. So I told you the zigzag, but the zigzag here, you can probably see best what the use for that is. Because it's had these holes here, which means that if German soldiers were uh, raiding, were attacking the trench, could hide behind this one, put their gun there and stop the intruders and stop the raiders. Now we have these little stones here, of course, but back in those days, this was mud. The soldiers here were constantly with their feet in the water, they got trench food. Uh, there was mice, there, was, there were rats around. They got food, but by the time the food got here, it was foul tasting. They did try to minimize uh, the potential victims here. So there was never a lot of soldiers in the trenches here. So they were usually kept the horsemen's redoubt, a very a lot safer place. And only a few soldiers were in the trench itself. So this is the end of the trench of death. So we will go into the so-called mousetrap. But for that, we first have to pass through this uh, bunker here. So it might get dark here. What? And we have to watch our head. Go through the main bunker. You can see here these holes. This is, of course, if the mouse trap was raided. They threw grenades or they shot the Germans who had raided the end or the beginning for them, the trench of death. So there was also a big steel door here. Of course, that one has disappeared, but that was supposed to be locked if the, if the trenches were being raided. So this is the mouse trap. It's the end of the Belgian trenches with two observation posts. The right hand side one is observation post towards the other side of the Eze River and on the left hand side we have the observation post that is checking the movements of the Germans that are just there. As you will see here you can see the German bunker there in the distance. That is how close they were. They could basically wave at each other. So the two Belgian soldiers that were here they were supposed to uh, make sure uh, make sure and check if the Germans were not coming, if the Germans were not going to invade the mousetrap and their trenches. If that did happen, then the soldiers had to retreat and they had to retreat uh, in that bunker. And then, of course, with the access to the, to the, trench, to the trenches themselves and attack or shoot or, or throw grenades to the soldiers who were able to get into the mousetrap through those holes. It happened once and the soldiers did retreat, but they forgot or they didn't close the steel door. And you can imagine that's very easy for the Germans to raid and to attack the trench. They did. Luckily, the reserve troops arrived very quickly and they were able to push them back. So the raid was unsuccessful on the side. Here again. But this would be impossible to stand here at that time, of course, because just across the river there were German trenches. It's now a bike path. Now just some grass in between the two positions. You see the German bunker there again. But if you look at the pictures that they have here, there would have been more German bunkers. There would have been three there at the same time. Only one ha is still more or less there. More or less where I am now, we see we can see the German bunker there. The area behind the Belgian lines. And there, the mouse trap. So you can imagine this is not far, easy for the Germans or the Belgians to raid each other's trenches. And there had been a few attacks, successful attacks by the Germans on the Belgian trenches. So the Belgians decided to, to make their trenches more fortified and more safer. And they wanted to create a kind of a natural buffer between the two. So what did they do? It's basically a little bit the same as what they did uh, in 1914. They put some explosive more or less on the spot where I am right now and they blew a hole in the dike of the river making sure of course there's this natural barrier in between them of streaming water so it was not always a lot of water most of the time it was just muddy so raids were still happening but it was a lot uh, less likely to happen. Germans were of course the best at building bunkers nowadays we still recognize Germans as being very good engineers while the British uh, usually 
hid and sheltered in uh, dugouts, the Germans preferred the bunkers. As you can see, it's not a complete, it's not a, it's not a perfect bunker anymore, but that way we can see how they built their bunkers. No? A lot of concrete, but you can see that they also used materials of steel, of iron, that they found here, basically. You can see that they, found, they, they used the tracks of railroads as fortification, reinforcement of their concrete bunkers. And then from here, of course, the, the window right now, the hole is a lot bigger than it uh, was back in those days, but you can see here the Belgian trenches there, the mousetrap and at the moment, of course, the museum there, the tower. At the moment, there's nobody around me and it's so peaceful and quiet here. So, uh, I don't think you can have a landscape that is more peaceful. One biker. That is more peaceful than the one that I'm seeing and experiencing now. Very hard to imagine how it was more than a hundred years ago now. And this was also the end of our visit to the Trench of Death, or the Doldenham. This was the first video on the Great War or World War I in Belgium. If you'd like to see more upcoming videos, please hit the subscribe button.